The merciless killing of Teho Fadzopule sent shockwaves throughout the country. The 28-year-old was eight months pregnant at the time that uh, she was found hanging on a tree with uh, severe stab wounds. Now, the twists and turns in the case have caused a number of delays and her ex-lover, that's uh, Ndutuga Shoba, was accused of being the mastermind behind the case and faces premeditated murder charges. Now, Shoba was arrested earlier this year after his uh, alleged accomplice, that's Muzigaise Malepane, the man who confessed to the killing, uh, turned state witness. Now, as the case progresses, we turn our attention to the profiling of individuals involved in crimes such as these and a very interesting claim uh, being made by Ndutugo Shoba, the uh, boyfriend who suggested in court yesterday that this may have been a crime of passion. And to speak to us about that uh, is a forensic psychologist, Dr. Gerard Labaskagni, who joins me in studio. Doc, thank you very much for being gracious enough, uh, not only to wait for us, but uh, to come into studio during this time. As I mentioned there, a very interesting claim being made by the person who is alleged to be the mastermind behind the murder. And this is not even a trial stage yet. Yep. He's merely applying for bail. And he suggests that this could have been a crime of passion by the confessed killer. Mm -hmm. What should the court, once the trial starts, what should the court weigh up in order to come to a conclusion that his claims may possibly be true. You know, again, it's going to boil down to good old-fashioned policing, detective work, finding evidence to confirm or refute that allegation. It's not impossible that, you know, uh, that Shoba could have gotten the other person to commit the crime or this is the, the, the person who's already confessed was the only person responsible and, and is trying to dissipate the moral blameworthiness of what he did by sort of implicating someone else. Mm. So you can't take any of that on face value. That person would have to testify in Shoba's trial to say this was what happened. And of course, the police are going to be looking for cell phone evidence that confirms that, mm. movement, contact between the two of them, some movement between the two of them. Um, otherwise, I don't think that confession alone or that, that evidence alone would be enough necessary to convict Shoba. There had to be more than just that person's uh, evidence or statement that someone else was involved. Yeah, you mentioned the cell phone. We're going to come to that in a moment. But for a second, mm. I want us to mm. pay attention to the claim that's being made because I, I imagine it would not only upset the family mm. of uh, Teho Fadzopule who are in court during this bail application process, but it also going to, is going to raise some interesting questions mm. within society. Let's have a look at mm. it, Doctor, because you are the person who can assess these things. If Muzi Gaise Malepane, the confessed killer who now sits in jail, if he was contracted to kill mm. Teho Fatsopoli, would he have gone as far as he did, which is not only to stab the deceased, but to hang her mm. Mm. on a tree at a time when she was eight months pregnant? basically about to give birth. You know, that, that, that's a moral Does hurdle. that indicate yeah. a crime of fashion? Um, in some ways, yes. Look, the, obviously, to, to murder of any person is the first moral hurdle you have to get over. Mm. Specifically, for example, someone that you don't have a personal an animosity towards, that, that anger towards the individual. Mm. And um, thirdly, in a very, very cruel way, and, and as you said, this person was pregnant, that's, that's kind of a number of moral hurdles that you have to get over mm. to be able to commit that crime. Now, as you said, you know, she was hanged and she was stabbed at which phase which occurred. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at the case docket. Yeah. And there is a very unusual way of killing someone. And for me, that does kind of speak of a very personalized way of actually killing someone. You know, I think you, your normal contract killer, if this is just a business transaction. Mm. You go, you get it done. You don't invest that psychological manipulation of the crime scene and effort. You want to get uh, finish the crime and get out of there as soon as possible. You know, taking the time to hang someone up, you're spending more time on a crime scene. So I think there's interesting elements to the actual crime scene, if you look at it from a profiling point of view, that, yeah. that point towards a very personal murder. Uh, and that could be maybe there was a history between the two of them, uh, as, as one allegation is by Shoba. Um, or, you know, it's, it's difficult to say. But I think there's a very personalized type of murder, the way it's executed, just based on what I've heard in the media. So, so let's look into it then, Doc. Mm. Because Ntutuko Shoba 
does make a claim that yes he was known or he is known to the killer mm -hmm. and that he questions why he would contract or pay mm -hmm. someone that he knows to kill not only a person who was his girlfriend but someone who was carrying his child mm -hmm. and then he goes further uh, to question whether there may have been a romantic mm. relationship between the two which goes back to mm. what you are saying that yeah. he invested quite a lot in the manner in which he carried out mm. this crime yeah. was he someone who may have had a vested interest in the deceased mm. and again I think the crime scene could speak to that um, uh, as I said because the very personalized nature of what we're seeing this was not what we call an instrumental crime which is for example a cash and transit robbery mm -hmm. and you shoot the guard because the guard is blocking you from getting to your goal which is the money yeah there's no real personal investment in that guard it's, you're just an obstruction compared to the, what we see here which again just on the surface of what I'm hearing in the media sounds like a lot of personal investment in the way in which this person was murdered mm -hmm. so again it, it can get some credibility to show his claims um, maybe this individual himself just as I said, had a history with, with uh, Sekofatso and he killed her and he's now trying to shift off the blame. We do know in South African courts, and I've had that before in cases that I've testified in, mm. the person who kills the individual but on the instruction of someone else mm. can actually get a lesser sentence and the mastermind a heavier sentence. So it still could be that the confessed killer is trying to soften the blow, trying to find some mitigation for himself. To, to get a lesser sentence at some point, etc., by seemingly cooperate by giving up the mastermind. So there's various angles to this from legal perspectives to emotional perspectives. And of course, it's going to have to be a thorough testing of the evidence in a trial process yeah. with a good investigation to support or refute any of those allegations mm -hmm. for the court to be able to make its ultimate finding. But you see, you, you make very interesting points there about how uh, the confessed killer would be trying to probably get a lesser sentence mm -hmm. and of course implicate the person whom he's going to claim uh, was the mastermind and mm. exactly to that statement you're making Muzgai Malepane did indeed escape a life sentence mm. and so received a lesser sentence which is now serving whilst the mastermind is now the person mm. that is going to be in focus mm. what does the court need to do or what kind of questions Will it, have, will it have to ask and also investigative work to indeed prove that Ndutogo Shoba is mm. the mastermind as alleged by the confessed killer? They'll obviously look at was there some kind of a contact between these two people. If Shoba's claiming, look, I don't know this guy beyond for a, from a bar of soap, I never had contact with him before, but there's now evidence of some kind of physical contact they met with each other before this incident or telephonic contact whatsapp messages sms's that's of course going to be contrary to perhaps what he is what uh, shoba is saying right now mm. and that would definitely count uh, against him a lot so i think the police will be looking for that pre-incident contact which would show that shoba was the mastermind because you, you you have to have some interaction with the killer yeah uh, if you have contracted someone to commit that particular act and they'll have to find that link without it it's going to be probably quite difficult to to convict shoba unless he had some physical involvement in the actual crime a and so the link therefore that leads us to that is what ntutugo shoba says in court mm -hmm. yesterday that the police have had my cell phone since June 2020, mm. which was the month and the, d and, and, uh, the year that uh, Tseho Fatsopule was mm. found killed. And the police have only arrested Shoba in early 2021. Mm. And this is only after a confession by the killer mm. who then implicates yep. Shoba as the alleged mastermind. Yep. And he concludes, or he therefore tells the court that he does not think that the state mm. has a strong case because mm. if they've had his cell phone for that long, surely they would have arrested him back then mm. because what they have been trying to establish is a link between yeah. the two. It'll be very interesting to see what, on what basis do they arrest him now. Mm. Um, and it's not unusual to delay an arrest until you're 100% sure of your case. Otherwise, if you arrest someone too soon, when they go to bail, they'll basically argue that there's no valid case yet against me and, and the case will be withdrawn. So 
it's not unusual that a delay in the arrest until you're 100% sure, until you've done your self-investigation, whatever forensic investigation you still have to do, then you apply to the court for a warrant of arrest. That's the safest for the police to do it that way, mm -hmm. as opposed to jumping in early, and then the next thing you hear, a case is withdrawn against so-and-so, and it looks like a complete police failure because they haven't yet finished the investigation. So I wouldn't blame the police for taking long, but then you would think that they would have analyzed that cell phone, or they would be sure that there is a link between the two people before you even set foot and make that arrest. Otherwise, you can walk away with egg on your face with having the case withdrawn for you going to court to trial yeah. or, or just losing the case uh, in court. He also mentions that his longtime girlfriend, so he puts Tsehofato as having been a short-term yeah. relationship, which uh, I guess, according to his version, would have resulted in a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But he says that police have been questioning his longtime girlfriend. What might they be looking for there? Again, I suppose it would be, you know, what was the nature and extent of this relationship with Tseko Fatso? Because, again, you want to confirm whatever he's saying formally in a statement or in an interview um, and seeing that, well, are we finding contradictions? And all these little contradictions in what he says kind of points towards a very circumstantial case, which can be enough to convict someone in court. Because that mere confession of, of the, the suspect who's confessed, that confession, that written confession, isn't enough to get someone convicted. That convicted killer has to testify in court. Uh -huh. So if he refuses, which is why often they will say, we will suspend your sentence, we'll convict you guilty, you'll plead guilty, if you promise to testify and we, with, we hold back your sentence until you have given an honest, the judge feels you've given an honest, open testimony in court, and then I will announce your sentence. Uh -huh. Because once you've given a sentence, you cannot go back and change it. So the convicted killer could now, if he has been sentenced to 10, 15, whatever years, mm. can say, I'm not going to testify. And there's no mechanism to undo his sentence. Right. So you would normally have that control mechanism if you want to use person A as a means to convict the mastermind who would see, be seen in law as the greater problematic person, yes. in, 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 to use that kind of phraseology. Um, and like I said, that typically that person who masterminded it, who might not have been physically present, who could get a life sentence, where the other person who actually stabbed or killed the victim could very likely get a lesser sentence. So Muzuga Isamalipane may not be out of the woods just yet. He may even get a heftier sentence if his version is found mm. to not be true by the court. If the agreement was, we will, you can plead guilty, we will suspend your sentencing until you've testified at the main trial, and then we will announce your sentence. Yeah. But if they've already said to him, you have been sentenced in court to 10 or 15 years, mm. that's it. There's no mechanism in law to say, well, you know, if you wanted to have that kind of arrangement, you would have to say, we suspend your sentence, we convict you, but mm. suspend your sentence until we hear what your evidence is. And if the court's happy with your evidence in, in Shoba's trial, I then pronounce your sentence to be the 10 or 15 years. But if he's already been given that sentence, it's kind of done and dusted. You can't go back and change that later if he refuses to testify in Shoba's trial. Very interesting. And Tutugo Shoba, he is charged with uh, premeditating yep. this murder, which means that the onus or the burden is on him to convince the court why he should get bail, which is yep. why yep. It ha it's been so lengthy, his bail application. What, what might he have to prove to the court, seeing that the burden is on his side to prove that he's not yeah. going to be a flight risk and he is going to cooperate with the It's exceptional circumstances, and that kind of gets a, a little bit, there's not a precise list of what the exceptional circumstances would, there would be, but it would be things like there's really a weak case against the state at that particular point in time against him, could be a reason, it can be things like medical reasons, but unfortunately the starting point is you're not getting bail, convince us why. But you also mentioned the premeditated aspect of it. Yeah. That also means, in terms of the Minimum Sentences Act, that the starting point is a life sentence if he gets convicted. Sure. Dr. Gerard Labasakhni, thank you very much. And Pleasure. Uh, thanks indeed for explaining that to us so well. Forensic psychologist, thanks indeed uh, for your time. Well,